Hey guys, got another video for you today. What I want to start getting into is decision making and mindset stuff. So in this video and probably the next uh, video or two, we will be talking mostly about decision making, mindset, mistakes, how to approach situations, those sort of things. I think this is probably one of the most important parts of being a well-rounded defender of yourself and others. I also think there's a lot of things that we're going to talk about that translate into other aspects of your life, like your job or your family and conflict resolution and that sort of thing. So this is a very, very important topic for us to cover. It's going to be mostly me talking. In fact, it's probably going to be all me talking. So <clears throat> if you're looking for some shooting stuff, it's not going to be in this video, unfortunately. But like I said, this is a really, really important topic for us to cover. And we're going to do it over probably two or three, maybe more videos. So if you guys noticed, I redid my username on a lot of this stuff. And I went with Stoic Concepts. So I moved away from my old one. And... That's what I'm going to start calling all of this that I'm doing, kind of the umbrella of Stoic Concepts, which is maybe going to be a small business of mine. I'm not really sure. But what that means is essentially it's a mindset. <clears throat> but I want to talk a little bit about Stoic Concepts and what that means and bridge into common mistakes, which is what this video is going to be about. So Stoic Concepts... It actually comes from probably one of the most important lessons I learned, which is going to be the first mistake that a lot of people make, which is they don't approach a situation stoically. They don't investigate something stoically. They don't make decisions in their life stoically. So what does that mean? What does it mean to be stoic? Well, I'm not necessarily referring to the school of philosophy from the Greeks as far as the all the different beliefs that they had, aside from the core belief of your decisions should be rational, they should be logical, they should be fact-based, they should be non-biased, and there should, no, should be no emotion in your decision-making. And this is something that I actually learned from the first police department I worked for. While I was an intern, I did almost a sub-internship for a youth program. And the person who was directing that program was just a civilian, not a cop, not a government person or anything. And the lady running that program probably taught me one of the most important and critical lessons I learned in my entire law enforcement career. And that was that she wanted me to approach situations stoically. She did not want me to buy into anything that someone said, regardless of whether I had a gut feeling that it was true or not true that I needed to be fact-based, I needed to be emotionless. In the context of this, where we were getting kids that had been arrested come in to go through this program, and we needed to try to get them to see their mistakes and be remorseful for those mistakes and then take action to correct them. And it needed to be sincere. And part of that was we didn't buy into their excuses and their crap and stuff like that. And we treated them stoically, without emotion. Not that we treated them bad. We just didn't empathize with them, if you would, in a, in a way. I didn't fall victim to their emotions. Because there's a lot of situations where you might come across something and somebody's very emotional about something and they're trying to get a reaction out of you. And you are drawn so much to feed into that reaction that you lose sense of logic. You lose sense of the rules on what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do, or what's right and what's wrong. And I'm going to give you guys some examples of this here in a second, but uh, this is probably one of the biggest mistakes I see is people getting emotional about stuff. People getting angry. People getting so wrapped around the emotions of a situation that it clouds their judgment and it causes some of the other issues we're going to talk about today. So an example I can give of this is when I worked for a small town agency. I was called to the sheriff's desk to 
file a report or to investigate a, a, report, a report of a stolen vehicle, I think it was. And when I get there, the sheriff hands me some paperwork and says that there was a lady that came into his office and she reported to him that her, her ex-brother-in-law stole her vehicle. And he ordered me, more or less, to go arrest the guy for fraud and for vehicle theft. And I asked him some details about the incident, and he couldn't give me the details because he hadn't asked those questions. So I say, okay, Sheriff, we will take care of it. And I was actually in my FTO phase at this time, which means, and I had already been a cop before. I'd already been through all this training and had years on the job. But I was in training at this other department. And I spoke with my FTO and he asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, we need to get the victim in the office again and interview her ourselves. Because obviously, more or less, the sheriff neglected his duties and didn't ask any questions. And what I found out later was this lady came into the office crying, so upset about this, what was going on, that the sheriff said, you know, he put his hand on her shoulder and he said, I promise you, we will arrest him. We will get your vehicle back because she was so upset. But he did no investigation into the situation. So what we do is we take her information, which is, I think it was like her phone number and her name, we go into our report writing room and I jump onto the computer and start looking up things in the system. And uh, we didn't even have the license plate number for the vehicle. But we had a claim of fraud that he fraud, uh, fraudulently signed her name on a transfer of the vehicle. So long story short, short we get her in and we talk to her and the person she was married to had died. And that person's brother was the suspect in the situation. Before her husband had died, he had sold his brother a vehicle. And they signed off on that. The guy had possession of it for several months. And get this, you look up the license plate and lo and behold, it's registered to our suspect. And I find out that the title that she presents me with that she said was fraudulently filled out, fraudulently completed by this guy, is a copy of the title. It wasn't the original title. So I end up contacting the guy, and he has the original title. And the title's in his name. And she tried to make it look like he was stealing the car from her, but she was in reality trying to steal the car from him. She was trying to get the cops to steal the car from him. And I told some of this stuff to my sheriff, and he was pretty offended that I didn't go out and arrest this guy because probably he felt pretty stupid about the situation. But he still wanted me to go out and arrest this guy, and I told him no. And I ended up having to write a report and get the county prosecutor involved with this whole situation. And it kind of ended up being a little bit of an ordeal. But that was a situation where somebody got very involved in the situation and didn't investigate it for what it is, and they made a lot of assumptions up front. Um, it was very, very poor policing. It was worse than rookie policing. It it was pretty bad. So, <clears throat> but without going further into that situation, that's the first mistake. Don't get emotional. Don't get emotionally wrapped around a situation where you... Forget what you can and can't do and what's right and wrong and forget facts. You need facts. You need, you need the information. You need the actual details that pertain to the situation in order to articulate what you can and can't do or what you will and won't do. Without the facts, if you just get a bunch of drama and a bunch of nonsense and a bunch of emotions, you're not going to make a good decision. So that's going to be my first recommendation is be stoic. Don't let your emotions cloud your judgment. The second common mistake I see is rushing. Now, what does it mean to rush a situation? So you can go quickly through a situation if you're efficient at it. Efficiency and things like that allow you to do things quicker when you are experienced, uh, especially in a law enforcement context or experienced with conflict resolution. You might be able to speed some things up and get through a situation quickly because you're efficient at it. But don't rush. Rushing means going faster than you can process. 
That also has a tactical context as well. But specifically, we're talking about decision making and processing a situation. If you get into a situation and you think you see something and you don't process all the information, it could be because you're emotional about it. It could be because you have some tunnel vision, mental tunnel vision, where you fixate on one detail and you fail to take in the rest of the detail. It could be because you simply didn't consider all of the different factors and didn't fully get all the information you could have got in that situation and you're jumping the gun, you're rushing it, you're making a decision, you're going to step 10 and skipping all the other steps in between. That's a big problem too, where I see officers making really early arrests without completing their investigation. I see situations where citizens do the same thing, where they see a snippet of a situation and get involved, but not having all the information or asking the questions or observing for an uh, sufficient amount of time before they can gather what's going on. Now, one of these situations that I can bring to your attention that you'll probably be able to see what I'm talking about in this context is there is a video of a police officer out of California. I don't remember exactly what city it's in. I want to say it was in the Bay Area, but I'm not positive. It could have been Sacramento or something like that. But this officer was working in what looked like to be a train station. And as he's at his post, he hears a gunshot outside. And he hears some people talking about a fight outside. And so he runs outside and goes across the parking lot, across the street, and like a block down from there, and sees these two guys on the ground fighting and a gun next to him. And they're more or less fighting over this gun, and they're fighting each other. And what he does is he gets into that situation, and very quickly he decides he's going to shoot one of them, and he shoots a guy. Now, this is not to speak specifically about this situation. That's just my example to kind of illustrate my point here. And I'm not trying to Monday morning quarterback that. Hindsight's always twenty twenty, But he made his decision pretty quick. And what was it based off of? How did he decide which person to shoot? And spoiler alert, he shot the guy that was being attacked by a bad guy on the street. And the bad guy had the gun. The good guy fought the gun away from him, kind of got it away from him. The gun went off while they were fighting over it. And as he's fighting for his life while this bad guy is attacking him, I don't remember if it was a robbery or whatever, the cop goes up to him and shoots him. So he rushed that. He rushed it. He didn't give orders. He could have had other options. He could have tried first and foremost to try to get the gun from both of them. While they're fighting each other, they're too busy fighting each other. They're, they're probably not going to kill each other in just hand-to-hand -hand combat, not, at least not quickly. But while they're fighting each other, could he have just tried to take control of the gun? Could he have pepper sprayed both of them and tried to gain compliance? I don't know. There's probably a few different options he had, but the point being, he made a choice with no information and decided to shoot somebody. And it was the wrong guy. So that's what I mean by rushing. When you get into a situation, you don't process all the information and you immediately make a decision, probably based off of assumptions or guesses or hunches, and you end up with potentially these kind of problems. That kind of leads us into the next mistake. So emotions, rushing, our next mistake, mental tunnel vision. And this comes down to training. So if you train under stress all the time, you're probably not going to be privy to stress stressors as much in the field when it comes to real situations. But when we have mental tunnel vision, it causes us to make decisions that don't always make sense. So mental tunnel vision, much like physical tunnel vision, physical tunnel vision, let me explain that first, is basically when, when people get stressed out to a certain point, their blood gets flowing and they get scared and they get in that fight or flight complex, they can have this hyper focus on a particular threat without taking the rest of their environment into account anymore. So me, as I'm relaxed right now and I'm in my backyard and I'm looking around, I kind of have rough peripheral vision where I can see and hear things going on around me. And if there's something moving over here, like a bird flew by earlier, I can see that. But in tunnel vision, it's almost like your body says, I'm ignoring everything else and I'm going to focus specifically on that threat right now. 
And this is something that you can definitely be trained out of because I got so much experience under stress in my short time in law enforcement working for a busy agency that I could literally type on my computer notes in my call while I'm talking and I got my phone on speaker while I'm taking a sip of my tea in the car as I'm in the pursuit. No joke, that happened at one point. Um, so you could definitely be trained out of having mental or physical tunnel vision. But mental tunnel vision, basically what happens is it causes, and it, again, these things are hand in hand. It causes rushing. It could be due to emotions and all that stuff. But it causes you to focus on one detail while not taking the rest into account. So a lot of times when people hear the, the term domestic violence in some agencies, in one agency, there is a particular agency I work for where they got really wrapped around the actual domestic violence. Um, people went nuts over that. People were running around like chickens with their heads cut off and were kicking in doors to houses and just screaming code over these places. But then if you actually looked at the details of the call, it says, hey, an hour ago, we saw this couple yelling at each other as they left and then they came back and now they're home again. Everything's fine, but an hour ago they were yelling and I want you to go check up on them. It's more of a welfare check, but because the dispatcher put in domestic violence, we're flying over there. This has also happened for civilians that are, you know, not law enforcement or anything like that. Somebody might come up to you who knows you and ask you for help. It might be somebody at church or whatever and say, this is happening. Something is happening. And all of a sudden you go from zero to a hundred and you're like, oh crap. But you go there and your observations show you something different than what was said. But you're fixated on the information you got. You're fixated on the intel you got and you act on that instead. So an example of that is a uh, Mesa officer who responded to a potential active shooter and they go to this hotel and their active shooter was reportedly on a balcony with a rifle pointing a rifle at people. Well, long story short, it was actually an animal or a, a pest control guy with a BB gun showing off to his girlfriend while he was drunk. Really stupid mistake. But anyways, for about 15 minutes, they're contacting this guy in a hallway and they've got him at gunpoint. And he's begging for his life. He's on his knees. He's in shorts and a t-shirt. And the call was that he had a rifle. Clearly, he does not have a rifle. And he's in very light clothes, like uh, shorts and a t-shirt. You can pretty clearly see he does not have anything in his pockets. In fact, his pants are coming down in the video. But the officer shoots and kills him anyways. Because, and if you listen to the guy's testimony, the officer says, I got a call of an active shooter. And it's like, you complete and utter moron. It doesn't matter that you got a call of an active shooter if you show up and it's clearly not an active shooter. For 15 minutes, you're dealing with this poor guy and he's completely compliant. And you shoot and kill an unarmed guy begging for his life and crying because his pants fell down and he reached down to pick up his pants because he's drunk and you say, I shot him because it was an active shooter. I didn't know if it was an active shooter. Well, my question to you is, was it an active shooter? When you showed up for 15 minutes, was the guy actively shooting anybody? No? Well, then it wasn't an active shooter. So that's mental tunnel vision. That's getting fixated on something and acting on that while rejecting the rest of the information, including his own, what he was seeing in front of him for 15 minutes while he was on scene. That guy should have been put in jail for murder, but he got off because the guy he killed was white. Nobody really cared. It didn't really make too much of the news. And everybody got fixated on his rifle because he had something stupid written on his rifle. And that was the big issue, not the issue that he actually killed somebody. So um, I remember when that first came out, I was a cop and we actually had a briefing about that. Um, but it wasn't until a few years later, I actually got to see the court case and the testimony and stuff like that. And it's absolutely insane. Absolutely ridiculous. I have no idea how he got acquitted. But anyways, so the last thing I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, common mistakes that I've seen is uh, complacency and or assuming information. And this one's kind of self-explanatory, but there's a lot of cops and a lot of people out there that aren't cops that I've seen been, that have been in these scenarios that I saw this happened on TV. Therefore, when I see something similar in person, what I saw happen on TV is exactly what's happening. Or... I'm such a veteran officer and I'm cranky all the time and I drink way too much coffee and alcohol throughout my day while consuming no food that I know exactly what goes on every time I get a call just by knowing the situation. I know exactly the answers. I know who's the suspect, who's the victims. I know which witnesses are credible 
and everything is BS and these guys are all a-holes. And that's kind of the old crusty cop mentality. And that is a huge, huge problem in our law enforcement arena still. It may not be a problem at your agency if you're a cop watching this, but it is a problem in general in a lot of places. I can attest because I worked for four different agencies and this was a big problem where people went off of assumptions. And one of my agencies, this happened pretty bad. There's There was a couple agencies that this happened at and on one of them, four people got arrested for murder that didn't commit a murder and they went to prison and they finally got released uh, after spending years in prison, which is pretty significant. But the one that stands out in my mind is probably the one that's most recent to me, which is I was working in a small town agency and this officer got in a pursuit when before I got to work. So this happened all before I was on duty and I didn't I wasn't aware of this. But so this officer gets in a pursuit and while he's in this pursuit, the suspect is throwing things out the window and the suspect sticks his head out the window and looks back at the officer for whatever reason. And the officer calls out on the radio, shots fired. He's shooting at me, he's shooting at my vehicle. Um, more or less, he's trying to murder me. And so all these agencies get involved in this thing and they end up losing the vehicle. They actually call off the pursuit, which was a good choice by the sheriff who was off duty, by the way, but he had his radio with him. So the sheriff calls off the pursuit. They end up losing the guy. So we end up looking around town. And as they're looking, that's when I got on duty. That was shift change. So I got on duty and they're doing a search for this vehicle. And mind you, they've been searching for this vehicle for about 40 minutes. And so I get on duty and it's been 40 minutes and everybody's in the field searching for this vehicle. Nobody's stopped the officer who was involved in this pursuit and asked him any questions. No, the supervisor isn't trying to get the full details. Nobody has the scene locked down of where the shooting took place. Nobody's doing anything except for trying to catch this guy. And he's lost. He's gone. He's in the wind. It's been 40 minutes and nobody's doing anything else. And I, I was greatly disturbed when I found out that that was the case. I was like, what? Who Has anybody pulled off, you know, deputy so-and-so so we can talk to him about what happened? Nobody did that. Um, so I try to meet up with them in the field and everybody insists on they're trying to find this guy because he's going to murder a bunch of people without us looking. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. He's probably trying to get away, but not to say there isn't a danger to the public by having this guy out there free because there, there is, but there's not an immediate danger and we don't know where he is. And there's other things we need to do right now in order to find out who he is and maybe where he is that we could be doing. And in order to actually prosecute him for shooting at you we need to recover evidence we need to take photos we need to lock down a scene uh we need to gather the bullet shells if there's bullet shells if it was an you know an automatic pistol or whatever anyways the point of this whole long spiel i just i want to make sure you guys have a good background on it so i can reiterate this point is I ended up talking to this officer and I actually gave him a few directions because even though I was probably one of the newest guys there, I was the most senior in law enforcement. Everybody else was on for two or two years or less. I was on for about six or seven months at this time. I was out of training, but I had three years as an officer and five years in law enforcement before that. So I had almost eight years of experience in law enforcement prior to this, including shootings and pursuits and things like that. And I had started to ask him some questions about the suspect and about how the shooting happened. And we went out to the scene. Nobody can find any shells. We went and looked for witnesses that in the homes nearby, nobody heard any gunshots. Long story short, the reason he said that the suspect shot at him was because he stuck his head out the window. And this was one of multiple problems that we had with this particular deputy. But... He said that he was trained, this is his statement, he was trained that if somebody sticks their head out the window, it means he's being shot at. We literally could have killed this guy if we came across him. If I would have came across this car and the guy, you know, it was parked somewhere and I saw the dude and he took off running, I would have had legal authority to shoot him and kill him. If that would have happened, it would have been based on an officer lying about this and making an assumption, making a very grand assumption off of this. But anyways, those are the common mistakes that I've seen. So 
don't do any of that. Do not make assumptions. No matter how much experience you think you have, do not make assumptions about a situation. Evaluate it for what it is. Train under stress so that you don't have mental tunnel vision or physical tunnel vision and you don't get fixated on something. And when you feel yourself getting fixated, take a step back, look around at all the information. Do not rush. Do not rush the situation. You want to get enough information before you can determine what action you can take. We don't want to go in and shoot the wrong person. And I've got dozens of police um, examples that I can give, especially as of last year. For some reason, last year was a bad year for it, where cops showed up and shot the victim. Don't do that. You don't want to be that person that does that. You don't want to be that officer. You don't want to be that citizen that does that. We need to evaluate this stuff properly. And don't let your emotions cloud your judgment. Some of these situations can be pretty intense and it's very important to remain non-biased, not let your personal emotions, your personal feelings get into this situation. And you've got to remember that even your enemies, even the people you don't like, you could show up and the person you hate the most is the one you have to defend. Just remember, if you believe in rights for everybody, everybody gets them, including the bad guys. The bad guys have rights too. So it's important for us to respect those because if we sacrifice their rights, then by the stroke of a pen, you could be determined to be the bad guy. And that's not a society I want to live in. So I hope this was helpful for you guys. This is just an introduction. I want to talk a lot about how to approach situations, different solutions to different problems, strategy and things like that, because I really think there's a lot to unpack here and there's a lot of really good information to share with different people on this topic. So with that being said, guys, thank you so much for watching. Be safe out there and God bless.